So my name is Ben Seri. I'm the VP of Research at uh, Armis. And today with me, I have uh, Doris Usman. He's a researcher on my team. Armis uh, is an agent, agent this IoT security company, which is focused on security in IoT devices and manage, unmanaged devices in general, um, specifically in enterprise organizations. Part of the goal of our company is to better understand the threat landscape that IoT devices and wireless protocols in general pose on the security of an enterprise network. So part of this cause came up and led us to this research. Um, and it started by understanding that there is a recent trend in which enterprise-grade access points actually embed in them an additional radio chip, a BLE, a Bluetooth Flow Energy chip. And this additional chip um, is there to have new features for access points, but it also naturally introduces a new threat landscape um, and opens the possibility of a network bridge coming from a BLE connection. And in fact, in the process of this research, we, saw, we found uh, two zero-day vulnerabilities uh, affecting TI BLE chips that are used by Aruba, Meraki, and Cisco access points. And so, what is our agenda for today? Uh, it's, it's quite packed, uh, so I, I hope uh, we've, we, we managed to get to everything. But initially, uh, I'm going to talk about BLE in general. Uh, where is it used? Why is it used? Um, how is it being adopted in different uh, verticals in the environment? Um, and then, specifically on access points. Why is it used in the access points? What are the features that are embedded in access points for for carrying out BLE uh, functionalities. Then I'm going to talk about um, over-the-air firmware upgrades for BLE chips. So what are the me me mechanisms for allowing OTA firmware upgrades um, in BLE chips? Are they secure? When are they secure? Uh, and so forth. And then we're going to discuss the two vulnerabilities that, we, that I mentioned. The first um, is the vulnerability that affects Aruba access points. There are BLE firmware uh, in, the, in the BLE chip that's used in the access points. And then I'm going to talk about the second vulnerability, which is vulnerability in TI's uh, Texas Insurance BLE stack that is used in many of their BLE chips. And this is an RC vulnerability, I think, uh, maybe as, as far as I know, the first vulnerability found in a BLE controller or Bluetooth controller level, right? Uh, so really close to the hardware uh, level. And Endor is going to talk exten extensively about how we exploited uh, this vulnerability uh, on a Cisco access point and the general impact of this uh, on networks and the security of uh, BLE uh, as well. So to, begi to begin, um, just a bit about Bluetooth Flow Energy. Why, why is it used? What, what is the benefits of having Bluetooth Flow Energy in uh, different uh, environments, different verticals? So Bluetooth Flow Energy is kind of a, the cool new kid around the block. When you look at uh, Bluetooth protocol in general, uh, it's been around a, uh, a few years, but it's really got adopted very fast by many industries. Um, there are good causes for this. It is the, the newer version of Bluetooth, so it doesn't have many of the uh, old uh, gener generation code that was involved in Bluetooth, uh, so it's uh, much cleaner. And it's also lower energy, right? So there was a lot of applications that can benefit from it being lower energy. And it is being used in many verticals, like I mentioned. Uh, it's used in the healthcare devices, medical devices, in healthcare uh, systems in general, in manufacturing, warehouses and facilities, in retail, and in, in general IoT devices that, are, uh, that you can find throughout offices. But why really is it uh, used in access points? What is the use case there? So access points ha has the advantage of already being deployed throughout many organizations, right? They are the backbone to serving Wi-Fi to the entire organization, so they are already uh, the infrastructure is already there. So any application that uses BLE can benefit from the fact that an access point can be part of that application um, since it's already deployed in the organization. And, and in fact, there are many um, different applications that take advantage of this uh, 
uh, ability. You have uh, indoor navigation systems, for example. You want to do navigations inside a closed uh, building, and so the access points will send out beacons, which can help uh, implement indoor navigation systems. You can also see the in medical uh, asset tracking applications or other asset tracking uh, applications where you want to track devices, their location, and so you put a beacon on on the devices you want to track, and the access points will track these beacons. Retails also use um, BLE for customer tracking, or what we also <laughs> uh, look at as spying on their customers in, in some sense. Um, but uh, they, this allows them to engage with customers, right, and to know uh, if some specific person entered the shopping mall or something, and now we can show him a specific uh, advertisement or something. And then you have uh, the last uh, use case that's getting traction also uh, in recent years is the use of smart sensors, um, mainly in manufacturing, but others have it as well. The sensors will uh, send out the reads over BLE beacons, and access points can serve as gateways to those beacons, uh, connecting them to the cloud or the, or the internet in general. But really, when we uh, looked at the vulnerabilities uh, found in these devices, in, the, in these chips, and their effect on access points and on networks through, through that, uh, that, those vulnerabilities, our, our impact was similar to the internet's uh, impact once we released our research. Why really do you need BLE in access points? And like uh, one person wrote in slash dot, obviously it is there to increase the attack surface. So, as I mentioned, there are two vulnerabilities uh, we found and we're going to discuss today. BLE stack has different layers um, and different functions to in, in the layers. In TI's chips, we're going to talk about uh, most of these layers are embedded inside, uh, the, on, inside one chip. It's a system on chip, so it has uh, it embedded all of these layers inside the chip. But it can be also be split between uh, a couple of different processes. Uh, it's much simpler than the classic Bluetooth. It's not so many parts. But uh, essentially, you have in the controller layer, you have a physical layer, you have the link layer. That does most of the uh, basic functionalities, uh, low layer functionalities for the protocol. <coughs> and in that link layer, uh, we also found one uh, vulnerability, as I mentioned, that affects BLE stacks uh, in TI chips. And this Chips are already also used by Cisco and Iraqi access points, so they affect these. But they can also affect other devices, right? Because it's a BLE stack uh, vulnerability in these chips. Uh, any device that uses these chips in the vulnerable state will be affected by this vulnerability. So it's, uh, it has a potential to affect many devices. When you continue up the stack, you have all these uh, parts that are in the host layer, and they are uh, their function is more high level. They uh, create creating connections, listening for connections. Uh, you have this specific part is called GAT, which is uh, the most simple way to transform transfer da data over BLE. It's like a REST API, if you may, like for for BLE. So it allows you really uh, a simple way to transfer data. And on top of that, you have a specific application, and that will obviously change between one device and another. Uh, what is its use case of BLE? And in this layer, uh, we found the vulnerability that affects Aruba, uh, which I'm going to talk about now. now. So when you look at over-the-air solutions for firmware upgrades in BLE chips, so these chips are standalone devices, right? They don't have any other communication channel other than BLE. They are not connected to the internet. They are standalone. You can find them in IoT devices or uh, even in access points where, where they're um, alongside another processor. And so they need to find a way to do firmware upgrades over there, over BLE. And so we, we wanted to see what are the challenges in these solutions. There are two major vendors that do BLE chips as standalone uh, system of chips. Texas Instruments and Nordic Semiconductors, there are others, but just for the use of uh, for this, uh, let's consider these two. Um, and they have each a separate framework for doing OTA upgrades. Texas Instruments has OED, over-the-air download, and Nordic has DFU device framework upgrade. So the challenges in securing these um, solutions, these frameworks, 
are obvious, um, right? You need to find a way to uh, transfer the firmware over BLE in a secure manner so it can't be captured. BLE has encryption, but in order to use that encryption, uh, the best way to do so is to create a bond, a BLE bond, which is the, the equivalent of Bluetooth pairing. Um, and so that's another challenge. You want these connections to be over a bonded BLE connection. And then you want to use authentication that's also connect, connected to the fact you have, um, you, you've done a BLE bond prior. So is the connection authenticated? Can you validate who is doing fir the firmware upgrade? And lastly, but most importantly, you want to validate the integrity of the firmware that has been uploaded. You, either with a digital signature or in other means, you want to validate that the firmware is really uh, trustworthy. Uh, in practice, these frameworks um, exist for a few years, but not so many. The, the recent versions are more secure, but the ones that are used today in market are not that secure or not secure at all. Um, the firmware are, are passed and encrypted over the air. GAT connections is not authenticated. Again, this is by the default configuration. Each application can uh, change this, but, but uh, by default, it's not authenticated, and the firmware is not validated. Or if it is validated, it uses a weak cryptography for signature that can be abused. So when we looked at the Aruba access point, we wanted to understand what is the attack surface here. And so the first thing that we did is we tried to connect to GAT um, when the Aruba is in beaconing mode. So we're, and access point has uh, different modes when it's uh, using the BD functionalities, but the most basic one is using a beaconing mode. It just sends out a specific unique identifier over advertising packets. But to our surprise, even in that mode, the GAT was still open and we can connect to it and see the services that uh, this device exposes. More interesting was the specific unique identifier, which is TI's OED uh, service. So it seems there is just maybe the ability to upload firmware to this BD chip over OED. A bit about OED in general, just to understand the um, mechanics of it. It's pretty simple. You have a user, there is a device you want to upload its uh, firmware to it. Um, the first thing is initiating a GAT connection, and then you can send an image identify message, a simple message with a firmware header in it. And if that firmware is um, in the correct version or something, something pretty simple, um, the device will acknowledge it by sending an image block request, which will then follow an image block message sent from the user to the device containing a chunk of the firmware. And this will continue, this process for sending chunks of the firmware will be uh, in a loop in, until all chunks have been sent, at which point the device will reboot into the new firmware. So very straightforward. So naturally we tried just uploading our firmware over OED to the Aruba access point, uh, and it didn't really work. We initiated a GAT connection, we sent an image identify, but no response was received. So something was customized by Aruba's implementation, and we wanted to find out, find out what. So the logical next step, let's open this up, let's hook up the debugger and dump the firmware. And in fact, when looking at this function that does the OED uh, functionalities in the firmware, we notice there is an additional call to memcompare here. So maybe Aruba added, like I mentioned, something custom that validates an OED in some sense. When you look at TI's OED function, uh, this function receives any GAT write request um, and then dispatches them to specific functions. So it's very simple. You, you compare the unique identifier that's being, being written right now to the image identifies UAD, and if it is so, you, you can call the function that handles that, that uh, um, message. And if, if you find it uh, to be equal to another uh, value for the image block message, you can call that function that handles that message. So it's very straightforward. In a robust implementation, like I said, we found that there is an additional code here. Um, and zooming in on the mem comparers that I talked about before, uh, there is just two more mem comparers or three more mem comparers here that validate um, an another you unique identifier. And if you write the specific uh, unique identifier of the OED unlock UUID, 
with a specific value, with the OED cookie, uh, then that unlocks a specific global state is already unlocked. <clears throat> and if you do this with another value, that unlocks another state. And this is some pseudocode of the uh, uh, function that we re reverse engineered uh, before. So obviously, Aruba added a hard-coded password to their implementation. It is not meow1234, but it's not uh, a good solution uh, either way. And so, um, really what this is, is the ability to upload firmware over BLE on an unauthenticated connection using this hard-coded password, and then you can have your own malicious code on this BLE chip. So what, what can an attacker do uh, by gaining access to a BLE chip inside an access point, right? It's still, initially it's still confined to only being affecting this specific chip. Um, how can he continue his attack? What, what is the next step for him? So Aruba access point design is such that the BLE chip has access to two York interfaces, serial uh, York interfaces. <clears throat> One of them is used uh, for configuration of the BLE chip from the main CPU and from BD packets being sent back from the BLE chip to the main CPU. So this interface is one avenue for an attacker to look for additional vulnerabilities to try and target the main CPU of an access point. But another one exists here that is actually much simpler. Aruba access points uh, can be configured to allow uh, a user to connect to a console, to a terminal console, over a BD connection. So this is the same console you get if you connect a serial cable to a network uh, device, but this is offered over a BD connection. And this could be useful in some scenario where the access point uh, needs to be configured you know, for network configurations, but it's not physically accessible. It's uh, um, way up in the ceiling or something. So this feature um, is implemented by the fact that the URT interface between the console and the main CPU is shared with the BLE chip. So the BLE chip may be able to use this interface uh, by an attacker and get access to that shell interface. And this en shell interface exposes um, a few commands. You can configure the network configurations of an access point. You can even send packets within the network. It can be password protected, but it actually can also be not password protected. It's not a must. And that password can also potentially be brute forced. So it's not, um, it's not a hard uh, security uh, solution. So how would an attack with bidding bit look like? How would it um, be carried out? First, like I mentioned, you can upload the firmware to a BLE chip using the hard-coded passwords. Then the attacker can up, use a firmware that gives him access to this console connection. Although this connection is uh, configurable by the main CPU, the BLE chip is the one that carries out whether it's on or off. So once you're on that chip, you can make it access that your interface regardless. Looking at an entire network here, or zooming out a bit, an access point will generally have access to multiple segments, right? Uh, it will serve both a corporate network and a guest network, or maybe other segments. So gaining access to the main uh, CPU of an access point can potentially lead an attacker to access all of these segments. If the network is connected to the internet, like many are, an attacker can also take advantage of this and create an outbound connection to a CNC server. And that, at that point, he no longer needs to be uh, in the vicinity of the device that he's attacking. He doesn't need to use BLE. He can create a backdoor over that CNC connection, and then uh, the attack can continue over the internet. OK, so we wanted to, um, to see how an attack like this would work. Uh, and because we are also engineers and we like the idea of it, uh, we decided to take the attack airborne, as you'd see in a minute. Yeah, so our office is in Tel Aviv, um, in a high floor. Um, so we wanted to see if we can come from the air, literally, and attack in a room access point sitting in our um, office. We installed an Ubuntu 
on an, an old Nexus 5. We attached it to a drone. I'm the hacker for, for this uh, demonstration. And the smartphone is connected with a server connection to a CNC server, CNC server, which the laptop is also connected to. So the laptop on the ground controls the smartphone in there. Yeah, so getting to the 27th floor uh, was a bit of a challenge. Uh, and the Mavic didn't really like the added weight, but, but he managed. <laughs> and here on the table is the Aruba access point waiting to be owned. Okay, so once, once uh, the drone or the smartphone is uh, nearby, you can search for beacons. The Aruba access point is in beaconing mode, right? So you can find the MAC address uh, by that. You can use the GAT tool to find the OBD service. And then we wrote a small script that just uses the hardware, the password we retrieve from the firmware and uploads our own malicious firmware. This is a bit sped up, but it takes about a minute to upload a firmware. So that firmware allows us access unauthenticated to this shell interface. So we just use the shell access on the AP, and through this BLE connection, we can change network configurations. Um, you know, we use uh, if config route, all of these commands. And you can also send packets within the network. There is the ping command for that. Um, an interesting aspect is that the BLE is connected to this console interface. Uh, even throughout a boot of a reboot of the, of the device. So by rebooting the AP through this interface, we can access the boot loader shell over this BLE connection and change boot parameters, uh, maybe potentially even upload like an older firmware version of the entire AP or something. Yeah, as, I, as I mentioned, if the attacker does achieve code execution on the main CPU, he can create an outbound connection, and then the vicinity of the drone is no longer needed. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so this is one vulnerability that we one it's significant, but we have more to discuss. So this second vulnerability, as I mentioned, is in TI's BLE stack, and it affects the Scrum Iraqi um, access points, but potentially other devices. And this vulnerability is in the code that parses beacons, parses incoming packets. In BLE, you have different roles. A device can be scanner, dev uh, in scanner role or an adv advertiser role, um, and it's simple, right? One, one device will send out beacons through what is called advertising packets, and the other will listen to these packets um, and parse them as they come in. And you have three channels for, that are fixed channels for advertising packets on BLE, and so the advertiser will send these packets on all of these channels, and the scanner will hop between, this, between the frequencies and listen to these packets. A BLE uh, packet is, has a structure that is pretty uh, straightforward. You have a preamble, a fixed access address, and then a PDU that is different between if it's an advertising channel or another channel. In advertising channel, you have a two bytes header, um, and then 30, up to 37 bytes of payload. This two byte header um, is built up with uh, different uh, flags, but there is one interesting uh, piece here that I want to mention. There is a length field t um, in the header, and that actually changed. The length field changed between Bluetooth 4.2 and Bluetooth 5. Bluetooth 5 is now becoming uh, introduced into the market, so chips are uh, being designed to use this new protocol. And the length field between Bluetooth 4.2 and Bluetooth 5 increased from 6 bits to 8 bits. And the, in the older version, in 4.2, uh, there were an additional 2 bits in that byte uh, reserved for future use, every few bits. And they were also always supposed to be zero bits. So this change in the specification might have, in retrospect, um, led to the vulnerability that we found. We're not sure, but, but this looks uh, ominous, right? The fact that the length field changes uh, as a um, potential for, for bugs. 
looking specifically on the architecture of TI's uh, BLE chip, it's a, it's a, it's a quite a, quite an interesting device. You, ha you have two cores. You have the main CPU that's running an ARM CPU, and this one does most of the logic, most of the um, BLE stack logic. And then you have your radio, radio core that also runs in our C CPU, and that one uh, does the more, more physical layer stuff and really the low-level handling um, of packets. And the link layer is actually split, split between these two cores, and they have a shared, in shared interface to exchange the packets that are coming in. There are also systems where you have an additional CPU, like an access point, so the application layer will be split between the BLE chip and the external CPU uh, over some interface, either your interface or, or, not, or another. Like many devices, embedded devices, right, um, there, there is no inherent security in this chip. There is no use of data execution prevention, no ASLR, and no MMU. So um, finding a vulnerability here still has the challenge of being able to exploit it. Uh, like any other vulnerability, but the chip itself will not stop the vulnerability with inherent mitigations. Okay, looking at this function, this is the function that parses advertising packets as they are coming into the chip when it is <coughs> scanning for advertising packets. Um, and it will do some parsing of the packet and some um, handling of different types of packets and such. And uh, instantly we see that there are a few problems in this function. Uh, the first thing is this handling of the length field that I talked about. As I mentioned, it's supposed to be six bits, but this code here takes the entire eight bits from the header uh, and calls it the packet length, right? It interrupts this as the packet length. So it doesn't mask out the RFU bits, the reserved bits. And the second problem here is the third line on that red box um, where the code uh, will decrease six bytes from the packet length. So there is a potential here to do an integer underflow. And the data length is actually, actually assigned integer uh, in this if case. And so if it is a small number, if it's minus uh, one or minus two or something, it won't be detected as a large packet. But even if it is detected, uh, the function that is called the hull assert handler is actually uh, a null function that does nothing. So the code will carry on, and uh, there is a copy loop at the end of the function. Uh, using the packet length passed to it, it will copy the packet onto um, the advertising data pointer. So this, is, this looks like there are many problems here, um, and the next step for us is let's try and crash it. Let's send different packets and see what happens. <clears throat> and like I mentioned, there are um, the length field, which is six bits, but you also have the RFU bits, and all the eight bits together are considered as the length of the packet. So we have a couple of parameters to, to play with. Initial step was let's send the largest packet we can in the eight bits, but it didn't crash. So, okay, something is not as expected right now. Um, the next step was let's try and send a very small packet, right? Maybe we can hit this integer underflow, um, but this also doesn't crash. Next thing we thought, maybe we can't really touch these bits, there are a few bits, so let's send the largest packet we can within six bits. It will also be <coughs> potentially out of bounds. But this also didn't crash. Just for sanity check, uh, we decided let's send the largest packet we can within the specification limit, the 37 bytes packet. This didn't crash, it did reach the code that we were looking, looking at, so we are partially in the right direction. And last, let's try and turn on one of the RFU bits, but keep the packet at 37 bytes. So it is a short packet, but it may be, be perceived by the code as a large packet, which will result in corruption. And in fact, that did crash the device. So we understood there is another mechanism here that validates the input other than co the code we were looking at. What is that mechanism? As I, as I mentioned, the main CPU and the radio core share the link layer. They both do part of it. And when we went back to the manual, uh, it was clear that um, it, the radio core validates packets to be between 6 and 37 bytes. Um, but when we look at the code from the radio core, we see that it looks at the length of the packet as 6 bits, as defined, defined in the specification. Whereas, whereas the main core looked at, at the entire 8 bits, so this difference leads to this vulnerability. 
by sending a small packet, but turning on one of the RGB bits or both of them, uh, it would result in a memory corruption. And how we exploited this corruption and on a Cisco access point, um, Dory is going to talk to you now. Okay, so I'm going to dive deep into exploiting this vulnerability. But before we start exploiting, we need a victim. So we chose this Cisco AP to exploit it on because it contains the CC2640 chip. And uh, naturally, we opened it up, hooked up a debugger, and dumped the firmware and started understanding where the data that is being, that is corrupting and what are we exactly corrupting. So looking back at the vulnerable function that Ben talked about, you can see that the advertising data variable is coming from the color function, which is the advertising packet. Advertising packet is a global variable that is statically allocated in memory, which is, it's an array, uh, array that uh, contains the advertising packet that has arrived, and it's, uh, it's in a fixed address. As Ben mentioned, there are no ASLR, no DEP here, so it will be allocated at the same address every time. And there's a lot of interesting stuff to overflow after uh, it's in the data section. So the, the one that sticks out the most are the, these three function pointers which are system critical function pointers that the firmware uses. So the first pointer that I call dispatcher is the system call gateway. Every system call that the firmware makes, every malloc goes through there. That looks like a really good target for us to control. And the other two are the enter and exit critical section function pointer, which, which does exactly that. Uh, looks good as well. They are called quite oftenly, but not as much as the dispatcher. So we're going to head for, for it. So going back to the vulnerable function, you can see the data that the function parses is coming from some data entry queue. So we needed to do some research and understand what is this data queue and where does this data come from. So this data queue is basically four entries of uh, packets that arrives from between the radio core and the main core. It is allocated in a shared RAM memory between those cores and uh, it's linked together to form a cyclic list, and also they are contiguous in memory. So let's go over quickly how would a packet that is being received would look like. So the, pack, the radio core and the main core starts off at the start of the, this list. The radio core receives a packet from there, so it needs to mark the entry as being used, goes on and fills the data, then frees the entry, so the main core can now start passing it. While the main core is passing it, the radio core had received another packet from there and filled it up in the next entry, so the main core can go on and parse it as well. This happens in a cyclic motion, meaning that when the radio core will hit the fourth entry, it will go back to the first entry and so on and so forth. Okay, so now that we understand where the data is coming from, let's look at this scenario. A normal advertising packet had arrived, and then the vulnerable function had copied it onto the advertising packet global variable. Okay, so far so good. Another normal advertising packet had come, same here. But now a triggering packet had arrived, meaning that we have turned on one or two of the RFU bits inside those packets, but it's in the legitimate length. And now an out-of-bounds copy will be initiated inside this function, and we can see that the data that resides inside entry number three will be copied onto the iCall pointers that we would like to control. Okay, so this gives us a little bit of hint of what, where will the data that we want to control will be held. If this happens in the second entry, then the fourth entry will, will be copied onto the iCall pointers, but what happens if it, we trigger from the third or the fourth entry? We copy data from after the data entry queue, which we cannot hope to control, and this puts this form of exploitation at 50% success rate. So now that we understand that we would like to control data entries that are not the triggering one, we need obviously to spray this data entry queue. So I'm gonna go back a little bit about how BLE does his advertising. Basically, there are three advertising channels or frequencies, which advertising packets are sent on, and the radio core is going to hop between them looking for advertising packets. So basically, if we want for the radio core to receive our spray packet every time, we're going to need to be on all three channels. Also, the radio, the main core, the radio core had a, has a, a packet duplication mechanism that helps it prevent seeing duplicated packets, and basically it validates that it hadn't seen this packet from the same sender, from the same MAC address. So basically, we're just going to randomize every MAC address of the packet, and then we will easily circumvent this mechanism. So now that we understand how we're going to spray, 
we're basically just going to spray packets that hold our desired icon uh, values that we would like to put on the icon pointers. And then after some time, we're going to trigger the overflow and do it again and again, hoping to fall into the right place inside the scanning process. So our strategy is as follows. We'll trigger the, the overflow from one entry while copying onto the icon pointers. And now we need to put meaningful values inside those icon pointers so we could execute code. So as Ben mentioned, we have no depth here, meaning we can execute data. And we know exactly where our overflow packet will be held because it's in advertising packet. So let's put this address inside icon dispatcher. And then when the next syscall is called, we'll just jump onto our packet and execute our packet. Sounds simple enough, but we have a lot of limitations on this expo exploitation. First, every advertising packet holds 37 bytes maximum of data. So we control the trigger packet and we control the spray packet, but spray packet has three icon pointers values it needs to hold. So we are left with 62 uh, shellcode bytes that we can use in our exploitation. This is not a lot of bytes to maneuver within, but let's talk about the task at hand that we're going to need to do inside those 62 bytes. We're going to prevent future overflow crashes. I'm going to talk about it in a bit. We're going to install some sort of backdoor because we want to keep communicating with the chip and controlling it. And we're going to need to restore the chip state. Because we are running from a syscall that runs a packet, the, the system thinks we're kind of in a weird state, and we're going to need to restore its original state so it will keep scanning as usual. And we have corrupted a lot of data on our way to the icon pointers, basically a 109 bytes of corrupted data that was written by our overflow until we hit the icon pointers with our control values. This is more bytes that we corrupt than we can actually control in this exploitation because we have only 62 shellcode bytes, meaning that if we will bring all the data with us, we basically have a little bit more than half of the bytes that we need to restore. So we're going to need to find a solution for that. And also, we're going to need to return some error value because we don't have enough bytes to actually do the system call that is expected of us because we are running from a system call callback. And then we're going to need to patch the system call address back, the icon dispatcher back to its original value. So we won't, uh, we won't be called every time a system call happened and the system can continue as usual. So when I looked at it at first, I was like, oh man, it can't be done. Like logically, we don't have enough bytes to do it. And I remember talking with Ben about it and saying, Let, let's just not exploit this vulnerability. It's too much. But Ben told me, let's take it part by part. And so I will take you through part by part of our exploitation. So the first problem is preventing future overflows. What do I mean by that? Let's imagine a trigger packet had arrived in entry number two and we controlled with our spray in entry number four. Now the overflow will be triggered, our code will run, and everything is good in the world. But what happens if another trigger packet just arrived in entry number three? So after our shellcode has, has gotten executed, the main code will go on to parse the, th the third entry and then copy uncontrolled data on the icon pointers and basically crush the chip. If this is left unfixed, we will eventually sometime crush the chip. So this is bad, obviously. We need to find a way to fix it. So let's assume our trigger packet was from the second entry, and now we can we have executed code. We do this nifty little trick where we link the same entry that triggered the vulnerability to itself, effectively freezing other entries from being touched by the main core or the radio core, because now they don't even know they exist. And now when the when another packet will come, the radio core will fill the second entry, but the main core will have to wait until it's finished because the, entry, the data entry queue is only one entry long. So now when the main core will pass it, everything is good, but now another trigger packet will come, no problem because we're in the same pool state that we used to, and now the copy will be called again, and we still won't crash the chip, but execute code again. Meaning that when we first succeed, we will succeed every time after doing this trick. This trick, costs us about three arm instructions. That's not a lot. And we are left <laughs> with 56 shellcode bytes. OK. So now the hard part. We need to restore execution of the chip to its original state. I don't have the time to go into everything, but I'm just going to talk about after a lot of research we did, we found that these variables must be restored for, in order for the chip to be in its original state. Uh, so we wrote some code that does exactly that, but I haven't mentioned our 
overflow will corrupt some gap task related variables there that are 16 bytes long. So now after restoring everything that we need and we have 17 bytes of shell code left for us to do logic, we need to restore 16 bytes of data, which means that even we can do it in zero instructions, we'll still have one shell code bytes for, for our logic to do which basically is a half of an ARM instruction. So our exploit just restores execution and does nothing. This is obviously bad, and we're gonna need to go back to the drawing board and take a second look at this. So we did some more research and found out that basically if we stop the gap task from ever running again, we can just restore those three variables, put a null inside one of the gap task callbacks, which make it, would make it stop running, and then we can just restore those three variables, making it not that byte expensive for us to restore those, uh, those variables, and we could now do, we now have 32 shellcode bytes for us to maneuver within. Still not a lot, but at least it's something. So now that we have restored the execution, we're gonna need to install some form of a backdoor. Because we have only 32 bytes of shellcode left, we're gonna need our vector to be really, really uh, lightweight and size efficient. And also, we would like to put there somewhere it won't cost us a lot of time and, and instructions to install the hook for our backdoor. So our backdoor that we come up with will be this backdoor. It's only eight bytes long, and it will, it will sit, our shellcode will read, rewrite it just above the advertising packet variable, global variable. What it does is basically checks if the first four bytes of the packet that is being received is a magic value, in this case PC, but because everything is static, we can predict PC every time. And if it's the magic value, it will jump over it and just execute our packet. That's great. Uh, and we need some, we need, now we need some runtime for our backdoor. So remember we control the I call pointers, so why not use the other two? We'll use the entry critical section to execute our backdoor. It is called many times during one packet parsing, making sure our backdoor will be called every time a new packet had arrived. And we'll use the exit critical section basically because we don't have enough bytes in the end to run in, the, in our backdoor to do the actual enter critical section. We'll just put a gadget that does nothing inside the exit critical section and render this mechanism useless. But still we get some execution time for our backdoor. So let's recap all of our backdoor. First, we set up some shellcode environment there, reading some variables into registers, then we're gonna stop the gap task from running, we're gonna install our backdoor, this is to store instructions because our backdoor is only eight bytes long, then we're gonna link the data entry that has triggered the vulnerability to itself, freezing other entries and making sure we won't crash in the next trigger, then we're gonna restore our corrupted values. As I mentioned, we need to restore only two variables, the time ahead and the BLE dispatch task ID. And then we're gonna unhook ourselves from the syscall um, uh, gateway because we, want, we don't want to run again. And that's it, basically. We have exploited the CC2640 with only 32 bytes of shellcode that we had in our disposal. And now I'm gonna pass the stage to Ben that's gonna talk about the demo. Thank you. Okay. So we are, um, as you as you saw, it was quite challenging to achieve execution through this small bug, um, but but eventually uh, we did it. Um, I'm going to show a small, um, a short video on how this is exploited. Uh, so you have again the hacker. Uh, it controls a uh, Raspberry Pi that con is connected to an Ubertooth. That device can um, be used to send BD packets, custom packets. And this uh, attacks a sysc at this point. On the right, we can see uh, the attacker scanning for BLE beacons. When the attack is finished, we will see the uh, targeted device uh, beaconing a specific um, message, a specific message. So, so on the left, we can see the attack going on. We send the spray packets, we send the trigger overflow, and now once we have a backdoor, we upload our um, specific beacon data on, onto the device using that backdoor. backdoor and we tell the chip to start advertising this uh, malicious uh, beacon, and you can see on the right, you know, the AP is saying it has been owned, um, and an indication of compromise from, from uh, just from uh, the BD packets. So in that state, uh, any device nearby that scans from BD beacons, like my smartphone, 
will show that, um, in fact, uh, the BD beacon is saying your APs belong to us. Really on to us. <laughs> okay, so yeah, um, we're really at the end. I, w I just want to um, uh, to p to talk about three takeaways. I think uh, should, be, should be taken from this research. Um, first, the fact that. Billy chips, radio chips um, that are sometimes considered peripheral chips can also be vulnerable to attack, right? They have CPUs, they run code, um, they can be vulnerable. If they are vulnerable, um, this can lead to something greater. This can lead in an access point environment, for example, to a network breach. So you can start for something very small like a Billy chip, that, but this can um, go on and then target an entire network. And third, the fact is that Access points and network infrastructure devices in general are practically also unmanaged devices. Um, the BLE chip inside the access point is not managed, right? The access point itself is just a device that serves Wi-Fi. It doesn't have an agent on it. It doesn't have too, ma too much inherent security. So um, in the global, like zooming out from the bits that we talked about um, into the general picture, um, obviously this is a threat line step that, we sh that should be looked at. Um, we have a white paper that details all of what we talked about in, in detail on our website um, and all the affected devices and vulnerabilities. Obviously, we did a security disclosure process, which I haven't talked about, but it's also detailed in this uh, website. And I think we have like three minutes for questions if, if anybody wants to ask. Maybe we were really, really clear. That's a good sign. <laughs> Right. Thank you very much.